Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 until 30. I think this is his tactic so that we can read one chapter today. Magandang style yan kapatid, gusto ko yan, amen. Okay, so we're going to read this uh, responsively, but we're going to focus on verses 27 to 30, but we will read from 21 to see the background of uh, this uh, passage. Let us read responsibly, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is, which is far better. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Father, we thank you for allowing us to read the whole chapter of Philippians chapter 1, uh, chapter one today. I pray, Lord, that you will once again speak to us that the Holy Spirit will use your words in order to convict us of the truth and of righteousness. That we will be convicted, O oh God, of the right things to do as a Christian. And that we're going to do the necessary things, O oh God, so that we can live a life that is becometh of our calling from thee. I pray, Lord, that you will forgive us of our sins, cleanse us, and make us worthy. So that, Lord we will benefit more from thy word. I pray that the Holy Spirit will be the one to control the service today and that everything, Lord, will be for your glory. Help me, Lord, as I preach because there is nothing in me that can expound and explain your word because your words are spiritually discerned and can be explained, O God, according to the mind of the Spirit. So help us, Lord, to have this mind in order for us to know your will for our lives. If there is one or two is not yet saved, O oh God, I pray that you will convict their heart regarding uh, sin and regarding righteousness, Lord, that you have purchased on the cross when you died, O oh God. I pray that you will continually work in our hearts, in our church, that we may be a blessing. And I pray, Lord, that you know the heart of each and every one of us. You know what is in there, our desire, our needs. Lord, answer according to your will. And give us grace to accept whatever it is. And live, Lord, with a result that we may continue to glorify you. Whether in life that it's smooth or even when we are in a rough sailing. We thank you, O God, for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, preach today about the topic, how to live as a Christian. How to live as a Christian. So we can see that the supreme example of living the Christian life is of course the Lord Jesus Christ. But then again people will argue that he is the Lord. So it's going to be very hard for us to follow his footsteps. So if we are going to take another person to be our example in living the Christian life, we can say that one of the dearest examples in the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. Amen. Because he lived a life that is becoming of the calling that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ. We can see that the Apostle Paul is an intense person. We can see uh, that he is sincere in everything that he does or everything that he did in life. Whenever he put his mind into something, he will also put his heart 
in doing that. When he was persecuting the church of God, he did it with his might. When he's trying to destroy the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he did everything in his power and even beyond his jurisdiction just to uh, destroy the people that are following the Lord Jesus Christ and propagating Christianity during that time. But Paul says that I did all of these things in ignorance, which of course will not excuse us because ignorance is not an excuse. So we need to be reminded that we are Christians and we are given the word of God not for a display, not to put it under a shelf, not to uh, uh, just put it aside, but we were given the word of God in order to open its pages, in order to read it, so that we will know the mind of Christ, we will know the mind of the Holy Spirit, and we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And as we grow, then we can be a blessing to other people. So he did it in ignorance, and then he got saved. He all of a sudden understood that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is God, that everything that Jesus said about himself and his apostles and disciples about Jesus Christ are actually true. So when he was converted and repented of his sin, he changed his mind regarding Jesus. He changed his mind regarding Christianity. He changed his mind regarding his life. He changed his mind regarding his action. He changed his mind regarding the master that he's going to serve. And everything changes. He became a new creature. And when Paul served Jesus, he did it with even more zealousness than when he is persecuting the church of God. He gave everything to Jesus when he got saved. That's why in verse 21 he says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So the life of the apostle Paul is a win-win situation. Not lose-lose, amen. It is a win-win situation because living, he will win by a winning people and a defying the body of Christ. And if he will die, then he will see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face and he will enjoy the rest of eternity in fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So it is possible for a Christian to live a life that will glorify God, whether in life or whether in death. And that is what the Apostle Paul exemplified in his life. He said, but if I live in the flesh, verse 22, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose, I wot not. He says, I have a choice. There is something that I want to do. There is some place that I want to be. And I want to be in heaven. Amen. And I believe you want to be in heaven. Amen. Other than on earth. So we can help you with that. After the service you approach us. And we will do everything that we could. To send you to heaven. Well of course not. So he says I have a choice. And that choice is actually no brainer. It is very easy. It is my choice to be with Christ. It is my choice to be in heaven. It is my choice to be with the person who died for me on the cross of Calvary, who was buried because of my sin, and who rose again for my justification. That is what I want to do with my life. So he says in 23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. It is not only better, but it is far better. No brainer. You, you, you do not even have to think about it. If you will be given a choice, do you want to remain here on earth or to be with Christ? Then if you are a child of God, then there is that excitement. There is that desire. There is that will in your heart to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. The most wonderful person who ever live on this earth. Amen? Amen? And the one who created us in his image and his likeness, that even though we turn our backs on him, he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross because of his love, because of his mercy, he giveth us grace. That we do not deserve it, but the Lord gave it to us so that we can be with him forever. 
But then said, in one place, all things may be lawful, but not all things are expedient. He said that nevertheless, yes, it is my desire to be with Jesus. It is my desire to be with God. But nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Listen, Paul is giving us the gist of the Christian life. We are not living the Christian life for ourselves. It is not because of me. It is not because of you. It is not because we need to enjoy the things of this world. It is not because we need to enjoy the acquaintance or the fellowship or our relationship with uh, our brethren here on earth. It is not about him. It is not about us. He says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. We are living, ladies and gentlemen, for others. Of course, for the Lord, for others, and not for ourselves anymore. Because it is our desire to be in heaven, and we are on our way to heaven, but there are people who need us. There are people that we can help. There are people who must be saved. There are people who must grow in the faith. There are truths that must be proclaimed. There are errors that must be exposed. There is a faith that we need to contend for. There are backsliders that must be encouraged to go back into the fold of the Lord. There are uh, Christians who are going astray that must be uh, led back to what the Lord wanted them to do in their life. There are so much need in this world. And by the grace of God, we must live our lives in order that these people will benefit from our lives. So how can we do this if we are not studying the Word of God? How can we accomplish this if we are not growing in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? How can we accomplish this if we are not going to become a, a skillful a student of the Word of God? And how can we do this if we do not know the mind of the Lord Jesus? Jesus Christ. That is why living the Christian life will never be easy. Aside from the things that we need to do so that we can be a blessing, think of the enormous enemy that is out there in order to stop us from serving the Lord. There is a battle without. There is a battle within. There is battle everywhere. And then on top of all these things, we need to be a blessing to other people. So Christian life is never easy. You cannot just sit down. You cannot be mediocre. You cannot be lackadaisical. You must exert more effort by the help of the Holy Spirit in order to be a blessing to other people. So many people are being deceived. So many people are in darkness. And if we know the light then we need to do something about it. We need to help these people. I'm just talking to Brother Matthew and Sister Rebecca regarding their desire to do more for the ministry that the Lord had given them. But it's never easy. It's not going to be easy. It is, it is battling the stronghold of the devil. It is going in the very front of the battle. And if you will not make yourself ready like the Apostle Paul, you will be annihilated once you start doing that. Because we are not immune from falling into temptation. We are not immune from backsliding. We are not even immune from apostasy. The devil will do everything in order to remove us in serving the Lord. In order to make us drop out of the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. But ladies and gentlemen, like what the Apostle Paul charged Timothy, that we must endure hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because Christian life is hard. Hard. Never easy. He says, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul is saying, I will still Desire to live, not because I desire to live, but because you need me. 
but because I can be a blessing to you. Because the Apostle Paul is not a selfish person. Some people knew something and they do not want to share it. Some people were entrusted something by God, but they're not willing to dispense of it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are stewards of everything that God has given us. Whether it be money, whether it be time, whether it be talent, whether it be information, whatever it is, we are a steward of that. And we need to be faithful in doing these things for the glory of God. He says, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. So he said, I know God will still give me time to live because of you. Because this life will be spent in, in giving you joy in the faith, in teaching you the word of God, in, in showing you how it is to serve the Lord. Verse 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. He says, I know that you will be excited because it is my desire to go there again. I know that some of you will be shouting, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory to God. Because the Apostle Paul is coming again. You see, there is a close relationship or a close, closer relationship between the Apostle Paul and the churches at Philippi. The churches at Philippi has more discernment than any other churches that were established by the Apostle Paul. The churches at Philippi are more appreciative of the Word of God than in other churches, maybe except uh, uh, those that are in Berea. Because they are uh, gladly receiving the Word of God and opening the Bible in order to see if what was preached is according to the truth. They have a testing mindset. They are testing everything according to the word of God they're not suspicious they are not saying that Paul may be teaching us wrong doctrine but there is nothing wrong to be sure amen sabi nga sa Tagalog walang masamang maging sigurista kasi pag sigurista ka hindi ka mabibigo pag sigurista ka hindi ka malulungkot pag sigurista ka eh malalayo ka sa maraming uh, pagkakamali sa buhay kasi naniniguro ka Pag sa panliligaw, sigurista ka, hindi ka mababasted. Ang liligawan mo lang yung may gusto sa'yo. Pag walang gusto sa'yo, hindi mo naliligawan. Sigurista ka. So, they just want to be sure if what they heard is always according to the Word of God and that is a testing mindset. Listen to me. So many churches are accepting new doctrines because of pragmatism, not because of the truth from the Word of God. Pragmatism means whatever works, then we are going to do it. But not everything that works is according to the Word of God. God God's work must be done God's way. And if we will do God's work our way, then ladies and gentlemen, that is no way to do the work of God. We are not going to be successful in doing that. Now, let us go to our uh, text from verses 27 to 30, having laid down the uh, uh, background of our study, Paul says, only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. You see, Paul is saying that there is a conversation, not uh, communication, not people that are talking to each other, but conversation means our conduct of life, our manner of living. In the Bible, conversation is never used for communication. In our time, conversation is simply talking to each other. But in the Bible, whenever you see conversation, it pertains to a manner of life. It pertains to our conduct. It shows who we are. It speaks of our citizenship. That is what is, it means by conversation. So, Paul is actually telling Christians that our life will show who we really are. You see, sometimes we can pretend, but who we are will eventually come out into the open. A dog can pretend to be a cat, but definitely it will show. 
because it will walk like a dog it will bark like a dog it will lap like a dog and certainly it is a dog even though it is bilingual even though it says meow it's still a dog and by the way there is no such thing as a bilingual dog that is only in the story that we that I told you before when the dog applied for a job and there is no such thing as a dog yes I know applying for a job amen so Paul says only let your conversation be as it becometh of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ ladies and gentlemen there is a conduct expected from a Christian there is a conduct expected from a Christian our conversation as I have said is the manner of life and as a Christian it, a Christian must have a conduct that is befitting of a Christian what it means is that a Christian must be a Christian a Christian should be a Christian a Christian must live like a Christian so the uh, people at Philippi can easily understand what Paul is saying because as I have said, conversation means citizenship or manner of life. Philippi is a small city or a, a, is a city, progressive city, under the domination of Rome. And in these places, there are small cities of Rome in many different countries. Even though they, it is not Rome, even though it is far from Rome, they live there like Romans. They speak like Romans. They govern like Romans. They do what Romans do. It is as if they are in Rome even though they are not in Rome. Like for example in the Philippines, we have a base before. Clark Air, Air Base. Clark Air Base may be in the Philippines, but that is America. When you're inside Clark Air Base, you are under the government of the United States of America because that is the property of the United States. You understand what I'm saying? When you are in an embassy, you are actually in the country of that embassy even though that embassy is not in the country of that, uh, that represents that embassy. Ladies and gentlemen, we are citizens of heaven. We are here on earth. But, but our citizenship is in heaven. So even though we are here on earth, we should live as a citizen of heaven. We must speak the language of heaven. We must dress the clothes of heaven. We must act the actions of heaven. And we must do what heavenly citizens does over there in heaven. Amen. So he's telling them there is a conduct that is befitting of a Christian and that conduct is what we call a heavenly conduct. Look at Philippians 3.20. Paul says, For our conversation is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven from when also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So while here on earth we live waiting for Jesus, we live working for Jesus, and our life must be surrounded by our expectation for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Christians are in this world, but we are not of this world. So we do not sing the songs of this world. We do not dance to the music of this world. We do not wear the clothes of this world. We do not speak the language of this world. We do not do the manner of this world. We may be in the world, but we are not of the world. Amen? Th that's why if you're going to look through the pages of the Bible, you will see Daniel who lived a different life. You will see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, while others are bowing to the idols, they remain standing, steadfast, trusting, worshiping the Lord, the, the only true God during their time. We can see that when almost all are compromising, there is Joseph who remained faithful in his service. That even though he is in a foreign country, he served with dignity and God bless him. 
throughout his life. And God used him in order to save Israel from famine during that time. Actually, effectually, the whole world was saved because of the faithfulness of Joseph. So we can see that we may be here, but we are not of this world. Therefore, our conduct must be something that is befitting of a Christian. It was mentioned a while ago, separation. Our lives must be characterized by separation. That we should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Listen, Christian, if you are a Christian, do not even think of entertaining unbelievers and to be unequally yoked together with them in any area of our lives. Because when we do that, we are showing a conduct that is not befitting of a Christian. We are in a small colony here on earth. And at least, listen, wherever we are, people should see heaven on earth. That's the point. Like U.S. Embassy. People can see America in Cambodia, inside the U.S. Embassy. You see, if you live in, in uh, Pampanga, especially Angeles City, when we were there, I studied at Angeles University Foundation, and we have so many classmates that are working inside the Clark Air Base. If you go inside Clark Air Base, everything is different. The driving is different. If you're in the Philippines, you can drive recklessly, but when you're inside Clark Air Base, you follow the rules because they're going to get your license. You're not, you're not be able to drive anymore inside the Clark Air Base. There are rules that are the same in America. So they may be in the Philippines, but they live like Americans. And some of them saying, so we are here in this world. But we should live like heavenly citizens. That when you get inside that base, you will see a colony of Americans so that when people will look at us, they will see a colony of heavenly people. That is why unity is important for us. That is why uh, loving one another is important that people should see in us. Why? Because it will show that we are really citizens of heaven. Jesus says, if ye love me, ye are my disciples indeed. Kaya kapangit nung nag tayo. Kapangit nung nagbabakbite tayo. Kapangit nung nagsisiraan tayo. Kapangit nung kinokontrol natin ang isa't isa. Kapangit nung halimbawa ako, pastor, ay mag lord over ako sa inyo. That should not be the conduct of a Christian. So we must live a conduct that is befitting of a Christian and a conduct that is becoming of a Christian. You see, the word becometh means worthy. A Christian is to live a life worthy of the Gospel. Look at Ephesians 4 1. Ephesians 4 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. We are called for the gospel. So we must live a life that is worthy of the gospel. Colossians 1 10. What kind of walk is that? That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. A pleasing walk. A walk that is pleasant to look at. A walk that will attract people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not lifestyle evangelism, but a testimony that will speak that there is a supernatural person working in our lives. It is a pleasing walk. Not only that, but it is a fruitful Work. It is a work that shows the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is a work where there is love, joy, peace, and, and this nine uh, uh, fruits of the Holy Spirit. And there must be also fruits of souls that are getting saved uh, as we share to them the Word of God. What kind of work is that? That is a work of good work. 
You see, the default for every Christian is good work. Sin, bad things are an exemption to the rule. Our default is to good works. When we got saved, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and in verse number 10, the Bible says, For we are His workmanship created unto good works. Our new creation is of good works. Listen. When we got saved, before we got saved, we only have one nature. That is what we call the old Adamic nature, the old man or the flesh. Once we got saved, the Bible says we are born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that is the old nature. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. John 3, 6. And that is the new nature. According to 1 John, the new, the new nature cannot sin because it is born of God. So now, there are two natures in one person. And these two natures, Paul says, are contrary one to the other. They will never agree on anything. The flesh will never agree on the spirit. And the spirit will never agree to the flesh. So there is a constant battle going on within us. And sometimes not understanding it will make us ineffective in the ministry. Why? Because once you got saved, you are uh, ecstatic, you are so happy, you, are, you feel heavenly, and then all of a sudden you will see that you desire the same sin. You desire to do the same thing. And then you got discouraged and you say, why is this happening to me? Why is, why is it that the things that I want to do, I could not do? Paul experienced that. The things that I desire, I cannot do. Paul experienced that. And then Paul says, because of it, I am wretched and miserable. And he said, in the flesh dwelleth no good thing. So, if you do not know the flip side, you will get discouraged, you will raise up your hand, and you will live a defeated and fatalistic kind of life. But understand that there is now a new nature. In one person, there is the old nature, and there is the new nature. If this one cannot do good works, this one cannot sin. If this one will never agree with God, this one will never disagree with God. If this one will not worship God, this one will always worship God. So there is a battle within us. That's why it was emphasized last week over and over and over again. Our greatest enemy actually is ourselves. Not Satan. Because Satan is from the outside. Our enemy is from within. And the hardest enemy to fight is the enemy that is near you. So there is a battle inside of us. So what can we do? But Paul says he praised God. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. If you are going to let the Holy Spirit lead you in life, then the Holy Spirit can overwhelm, overcome the flesh. And we can live a life that is spirit led, not perfect, but the default is for us doing the things that will glorify God. Amen. So do not give in to the flesh. Do not give in. But the sad thing is that most of the time, we are giving in to the desire of the flesh. That's why the devil now can do everything. The devil can tell you, oh, you're not saved because you're still doing sin. And once there is no peace in our mind, there is no way that we can serve God effectively. Once you are in doubt of your salvation, the very foundation of our Christian life, then we cannot walk in a manner that is becoming of the gospel or becoming of a child of God. So let us settle that once and for all so that we can have peace of mind and then believe and claim the grace of God. Because the grace of God will enable us to conquer the flesh. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the one our new nature is born of God. Therefore, it is greater than the one that is born of the flesh. You understand what I'm saying? So, the only way that a Christian can be defeated is if he allowed the flesh to control him. When the truth of the matter is when you got saved, 
God already break that control of the flesh from us. So now we can say no to the flesh. Now we can say no to sin. Now we can say no to those things that are not becoming of a Christian. So, good work which God had before ordained. It was already ordained by God. It is already the plan of God. God's plan for me is to walk a pleasing life. Is to walk a life that is uh, characterized by good works. Because this was created by God and ordained that we should walk in them. So whenever we are doing sin, we are walking the other way. But whenever we do good, we are walking in the ways of God if you are saved. Because if you're not saved, no matter if you will do good, it is just a filthy rags in the sight of God. Amen? So, we must have a conduct that is becoming of a Christian. You see, there is a standard by which we must measure our life. And that standard is what we call the heavenly standard. We must be equal to that standard because if not, then we are not going to please God and we cannot give a good testimony. There was this uh, a true story in the life of Alexander the Great. They were in a, uh, uh, a battle and then uh, in that battle, they are protecting their, uh, their place, they're protecting their their post. But then there is this one who neglected his job as a soldier of the army of Alexander the Great. So he was taken and he was uh, uh, placed in front of Alexander the Great and they told him what he did that is wrong. That can be uh, construed as treason and will be worthy of death. And then Alexander asked the soldier, what's your name? He said, sir, my name is Alexander. What is your name? He said, sir, my name is Alexander. Listen to me. It is either you change your name or you change your life. Ladies and gentlemen, we are wearing the name Christian. We are wearing the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is either we, it is either we change our name or we change our lives. Amen? We must walk according to the standard of that name. And ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. That is a very high standard and can only be achieved if we are serious in serving the Lord. You see, the Bible even says that we are God's epistle. Sometimes we are the only gospel that people may read before they even listen to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are God's gospel and we are writing a chapter each day by the deeds that we do and the works that we show the words that we say and the things that we do men may read what you write whether faithful or true just what is the gospel according to you if people will look at us what will they see? Will they see a heavenly citizen? Or will they see a heavenly citizen acting like a citizen of this earth? Not only that, but number two, there is a cooperation that we must exhibit as a Christian. There is a cooperation that we must exhibit as a Christian. Look again at verse number 27. Paul says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So, before Paul used a citizenship or political term, now we are shifting to what we call athletic term. And he is now comparing us into athletes or a team. Not an individual athlete, but a team. And he is telling us that as Jesus desired in John 17, 21, that we may be one, it is also 
should be the desire of each and every Christian to be united. Listen, we are not a divided people. We should be a united people. And our unity will speak much of how we treat the Lord, our God. So, instead of becoming a part, Christians should always come together. Our bondage must be, uh, our bond must become stronger every day as we grow in the Lord. That is why it is a sad commentary to hear when, when our preacher a while ago says that, yes, I remember a time that we were really united a long time ago. And we cannot, see, we, we cannot see that unity right now at the present moment. So something is wrong. Something happened. We are, now, we are not now working as a team. You see, team sport is very important. And, and the success of team sports lies on what we call teamwork. Nobody can do it alone. The Chicago Bulls have a very... Uh, Good player, actually, arguably the best player who ever lived. When as, as far as basketball is concerned, and his name is Michael Jordan. But listen to me, Michael Jordan cannot do it alone. Even though he will play against a weak team, he he is alone, he cannot defeat that team. There must be a Scotty Pippen. There must be a Rodman. There must be a Spider-Man. There must be whatever man. In that team, and not only that there should be other men in the team, but they should work as a cohesive team. Because if not, then they're not going to win every game or most of the game that they are going to play in the National Basketball Association. The same thing with the church. There must be teamwork. Do we have teamwork in the area of soul winning? Do we have teamwork in the area of giving? Do we have teamwork in the area of serving God? Do we have teamwork in the manner of our life, our conversation? Do we have teamwork in achieving our goals? Ladies and gentlemen, we should be one. We must be one. Because if we are one, then the devil at least will have a hard time defeating us. You see, sometimes the, the saddest thing is this, that the devil will not even exert effort because we are self-destructing. Why? By defeating ourselves. Have you heard in a sports where there is a, a great team defeated by a lesser team and then on the commentary they will say they actually defeated themselves. It is not because of the weaker team but because they did not play as one team. And the same thing with us. Why don't we backbite each other and in no time at all we will consume each and every one of us. So natin natin magsiraan. Tubukan natin. Sandali lang, ubus tayo. Wala na mangyayari sa atin. So pastor, what will I do if I do not agree? Well, you state your case. We test it from the word of God. And if you are right, we follow you. And if you are wrong, you follow what we are doing. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not about pride. It is not about what you want to do. But in a team, everybody does the same thing. That's important. Let's jog. For two miles. No, 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 no. I will do sit-ups. While the others are jogging. Why don't you jog along? Amen? And then later on, we will do sit-ups and we will do sit-ups with you. Why don't we jump in the swimming pool and exercise our whole body? No, no, but I want to jump over a cliff. Oh, we first jump uh, into the swimming pool and then you do your thing. And we will bury your cremate you. Whatever is needed. There must be teamwork. We must be one. When people will look at us, they will not see a difference in us, but completely different from them. Who already watched what we call synchronized uh, swimming? They are composed of many different people, but the action is like there is only one. Everything is in. is in sync. And that is very good to watch. 
If there is only one person who will make a wrong move, it is noticeable. That is why if only one will make a wrong move, then it will be noticeable to the eyes of the world and the world will say, I will not go there because that is a place full of hypocrites. That's why we are an undivided people. So what are we? We are a people with united purpose. Amen. Same goal. Our goal is to glorify God. Is that your goal? Amen. Is that your goal? So ask this question. Am I glorifying God in what I'm doing? No, pastor, I believe so because what I'm doing is right. But you are doing it your own, not according to the uh, goal of the church. So will it glorify God even though, you know, sometimes you may be right, but you have a wrong application. Right things must be applied right way. Pastor, masama ba magpunta ng church? Hindi. Lagi naman ako sa church. Ha? Ano araw ko na pupunta? Monday. Wala naman service ng Monday. Amen. Dumating ka ng Sunday. Kasi lahat dumarating ng Sunday. O sige, hindi ka masama ang action mo. Nagpunta ka sa church. Lunes naman. Oh. Hindi mali. Amen. So you may, what you may doing may be right, but you apply it in the wrong way, in the wrong day. So we need to be a united people, a people with one purpose. That's why in athletic term, the word strive is very important. It means several people doing the same thing. Have you watched uh, American football? Where there is a quarterback, he's holding the uh, football, and there are other members of the team, and the goal is to reach the goal. And then all of these people, there is what we call, uh, uh, hindi ko alam. Uh, linemen, merong mga nagpuputek sa ano, sa quarterback and wide receiver and all of these things. They may be doing different things, but one goal. And they do it as a team. They protect the quarterback no matter what happens. It's because when the quarterback is attacked, then the whole offense will fall. The same thing. Everything that we do must be for the glory of God. Because that is our purpose. And if we are not going to do that then, our whole purpose will fall and we cannot glorify God in our lives anymore. And we cannot live the Christian life according to how God wants us to accomplish the Christian life. Number three, there is a conflict that we will face as we serve God. We saw that in the book of Nehemiah. You see, they started to build a wall and then the people started to ridicule them and then the people started to upgrade their persecution until the time that they were threatened of their very life why because they're doing something for God when you do something for God the devil will do something against you and the God of this world is the devil and he has a lot of minions so he can use so many people in order to hinder us in what we are doing that is why we need focus that is why we need determination. Look at what the Apostle Paul says here in verse number 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversary, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Listen, opposition is a proof that we are saved and we are the people of God. Why? Because if we are opposed by the devil, it only shows that we are not of him, but we belong to God. Amen? So when Nehemiah were uh, opposed by these people, it only shows that what they are doing is actually for the glory of God. But our problem is this. We want to live a smooth life. We want to live a quiet life 
peaceable life. And we always quote the verse that as much as possible, live peaceably with all men. Have you noticed the verse? If it be possible. Question, is it possible? Answer, no, not possible. Why? Because there is a conflict. How can you live peaceably when there is a conflict? So we are in a constant battle. And that battle will never stop. That is why Peter says that we need to be vigilant. Why? Because our enemy is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The devil will never stop working against us. So there is a conflict. And we need to expect that because we are doing the work of God. But pastor, why is it that I do not experience any conflict? Because you are not serving God. Because you are not living the Christian life. That is why there is no conflict. It is hard to have conflict. You see, what we are experiencing today is very hard. Because we are in a constant conflict. Not only with the unbelievers, but sad to say, even with the believers. Because we do not believe the same thing, even though we have the same Bible. You see, that's the problem. So, why did this happen? Because the first century church did not do their job in order to protect and contend for the faith. They gave in. Ito, tanong nyo kayo. Saan ba nanggaling ang Catholic? Nanggaling ang Catholic sa Church na itinayo ng Panginoon. Isa lang naman ang Church na itinayo eh. Sa Panginoon yun. Pero as we travel through history and we're going to look back, all heretical teachings came inside the church that the Lord Jesus Christ established. Not that the Lord Jesus Christ taught any heresy, but it is because people were allowed to enter without the Holy Spirit of God. And they were the ones who destroyed. Why? Because the devil will plant his people inside the church so that it will be destroyed and will become ineffective. Why? Because when Jesus says, Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So the devil says, I am no match for the church. I cannot go against the church. I will plant my people, make the church weak, and then make the church defensive because if you are on the defensive, you cannot attack because you're busy defending yourself. That is where our churches are right now. We are on the defensive. We are on the maintenance business. We are not now attacking the gates of hell. Churches now are, uh, are active in ways that does not really matter, but passive on things that matters and what are those? The basic of the word of God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Exposing that which is erroneous and contending for the faith and preaching what is according to the word of God. Why? They are afraid. When we do these things, then we are going to even taste the ire of those people who are supposed to be the ones preaching the word of God. Sipin mong sa pangangaral mo ng katotohanan, makakabangga mo si Abante. Isipin mo sa pangangaral mo ng katotohanan, halos murahin ka ng mga pastor. Isipin mo dahil ina-expose mo lang kung ano yung tama, eh, lapastanganin ka ng mga tao na supposedly ay nangangaral ng salita ng Diyos. Why? Because we became so blinded by the devil that we do not know the truth anymore. And ladies and gentlemen, the truth is very simple. Don't you know that? The truth is very, very simple, but it became complicated because the devil planted his lies alongside the truth. They will say, 
believe in God then you will be saved there's nothing wrong with us but they will say there is no need for you to repent because just believing will make you saved John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life what does the Bible says whosoever what that whosoever must do believe and if you believe you have everlasting life why do you have to repent of your sin you only have to believe and you will be saved but ladies and gentlemen, that is not the, the complete gospel. That is not the complete Bible. The complete Bible is a, is a simple, the Bible says, that ye repent and turn to God. Have faith in God. The Bible says, repent or perish. Unless ye repent. The Bible is clear. So you make those two together and you will have the complete way of Salvation. So, Pastor John 3.16 is not effective. It's effective. Because when the Bible says, believe it, it implied repentance. And when the Bible says, repent, it implied, it implies faith. If faith is without repentance, it is not biblical. And if repentance is without faith, it is not biblical. Look at Simon, the sorcerer. Simon. He believed, the Bible says. Do you remember that when Pastor Jesse preached about that? He believed. And he followed the disciples. And then Peter and John came to that place. And they lay hands on people. And they received the Holy Spirit. And Simon saw that. And he said, can I buy that gift? And what was the answer of Peter? Your money perish with thee. For thou knowest not the things of God. So he believed. John 3, 16 says, if you believe, you are saved. But why is Simon not saved? Even though he believed. Because there is no repentance in his belief. Repentance is a change of mind. You will stop your sorcery and you will start following God. But he is following God without giving up his sorcery. Same thing here in Cambodia. If you're a missionary, you will understand better this doctrine. Why? At one time, we have a worker here. I will not mention the name. Maybe you, some of you uh, knew him. But he was staying in the church as a full-time worker, attending the church faithfully, serving the Lord, because he believed in Jesus. And then Pichum Ben came. He said, Pastor, I will just go to a friend. And... Uh, try to witness to a friend, uh, you know, spiritualizing things. And then said, okay, no problem. Anyway, it's vacation time. You can do and go wherever you want. And then after a day or two, I received a call from Pastor Roman. He said, Pastor Joel, your worker is here offering something to the idol. He went from Shimrip to Batambang to offer to the idol. So when he came back, I confronted him. I said, why did you do that? when you already believe in Jesus. Yes, pastor, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe. See? But I also believe. Wrong. There is only one way. There is only one truth. There is only one life. When you believe in Jesus, you change your mind about Buddhism. You change your mind about Islam. You change your mind about Catholicism. You change your mind about good works and you turn to God and you serve him that is genuine faith with repentance that is genuine repentance with faith but if only example I'm a Catholic I saw what the priests are doing so I will say I don't believe in Catholicism anymore because of what the priests are doing so you repented right change of mind but you did not believe in Jesus will you go to heaven no you are just not attending Catholicism. Actually, you will even become an atheist because you may not believe in God anymore. That is what we need to understand. As a Christian, there is a conflict and we must be up to this conflict by trusting the Lord in everything that we do. And listen to me. He says in verse 28, again, listen to this. And in nothing terrified why are you afraid of the adversary 
Why are you afraid of our adversaries? You see, listen. In Matthew, Jesus says, you do not be afraid of those who can only kill the body, but cannot send your soul into hell. But be afraid of God, because he can kill your body and send your soul to hell. Hell. We are already saved. We will not go to hell. So the only person, uh, the only thing that a person can do thus is to destroy our body. And he says, "Do not be afraid of them." Why are we afraid, Pastor? Because they will do me harm. So what? It is God who controls everything. It is God who will do the protecting. So why do we have to be afraid? He says, "In nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of." Perdition. When they are opposing us, it only proves that they are uh, they are judged by God, that they are going to perdition just like Judas. It proves that they are not saved. And if they are Christians, it proves that they do not know the truth. But on our part, it is an evident token of salvation and that we are of God. Amen. That is clear. That's why. Why are you going to be terrified by people who will prove that you are really a child of God? Amen? Do not be terrified. Why? If God be for us, who can be against us? That is our problem today. Why? Because we look at the strength of the flesh. And the flesh is weak, ladies and gentlemen. We cannot win the battle by using our flesh, but we can only win the battle by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. So, Paul is describing a specific kind of behavior that ought to be manifested on our part. Listen, we face adversity in life. He tells us there is no reason to be afraid of our enemies. A Christian must always be a Christian no matter what the situation is. Amen? So there is also a public show of our faith. You see, in Christianity, we don't lift ourselves. The default is humble yourself before the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up, that he may lift you up. So, Humility is the order of the day for Christian. John uh, the Baptist says, he must increase, but I must decrease. That is the default. But when it comes to our testimony, there must be a public show of faith. That even though we are being attacked, even though we are, being, we are facing a formidable enemy, we need to make a stand regarding our faith. Amen? We should not compromise. We should not give in. Wala. Pambira sa panahon natin ngayon yung mga heroes of heroes of snaring breed of faith na tinatawag. Nagpunta si Duterte sa Russia. Andun din siya. Kasi nga raw minority is snaring leader siya. Ano araw yun? Paano yung mga tupa kung kailanganin ka? Eh, meron naman doon. Hindi, ikaw ang tinawag na pastor eh. Ikaw mag-aasikaso. Pero yung atupag mo, pumuposisyon ka kasi meron ka mas mataas na ambisyon. Para maging ano, tirador. Ay, tirador. Ah, ano ba yun? Congressman tapos tirador. Meron ka, ito pa matindi, hindi ka na nakontento. Nagpa-picture ka pa sa the appointed son of God. Sabi nila, ano masama? Kayo hindi naman mga Baptist, nagpapa-picture kayo sa mga artista. That is the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, we should not be vain. The reason why people are can say this against us is because we are so vain. Nakita mo lang si Manny Pacquiao. Ito si pare ko, nagpa-picture na. Nagpa-picture din sa kanya, kasama siya. 
And then they invited him to speak in a Baptist church where pastors are gathered together and pastors will say, Preach on! Money! Preach on! Senator! Keep on! Pastor, don't you like Pacquiao? I like him as a boxer. Actually, I watch almost all of his fight. Some people before, but now they are uh, a new creature in God will not attend when there is a Pacquiao battle. I was in, in a, this is not to chide uh, Dr. Kison, but I was in the Philippines and uh, together with Sister Marvel, it was a Sunday and there is a fight of Pacquiao. And I was about to preach. Dr. Kison said, Bata, maiksi lang. <laughs> so I was called to preach and that is one of the longest preaching that I did. And I can see him I said, I don't care. <laughs> I'm there to preach the word of God. And true enough, after the preaching, we ate, we finished eating, and the bout is not yet on television. We went to Talavera, and when we reached, ay, a San, Le San Leonardo, Sa who's that Saint Delima? Hindi si, ano, Laila Delima. Lima, Peru, uh, Santa Rosa. We, we went to Santa Rosa, and preach in that church and at the middle of the preaching afternoon service that was the, that was the time when the uh, bout of Pacquiao was shown on television so you see if I cut the message if I give in to the whims of the people then we have wasted our time I have compromised and not glorify God in my life during that day at least so ladies and gentlemen I do not hate Pacquiao but Pacquiao is a Pentecostal guy. And the testimonies of Pacquiao is filled with seemingly good works. And he uses NIV in the pulpit where the pastors is very strong in emphasizing KJV. So I said, it has the appearance of double standard. Why? Will you invite a lesser person than Pacquiao to stand behind the pulpit even though he's a Pentecostal? Even though he uses another version of the Bible? Will you allow? And will you pastors listen enthusiastically if that person is not named Pacquiao? You see, we are in a popular Christianity in our time. Wherein if you have a name, then you have more right to become a Christian. Wherein you have a name, then you have more right to stand behind the pulpit. While people who really are saved, who are really pastors of an independent Baptist church, but they have a small church, will not be even given a chance to stand behind the pulpit and preach the word of God. And other people will even say that if you have, do not have a, a big church, you have no right to teach me. You sit there and I will teach you because... I have a big church. Pakilabas muna, tulungan nyo na sila. Ay, hindi pwede tayong ganyan. So, this is something that we need to understand. That there should be a public revealing of our faith. Do not hide your faith, ladies and gentlemen. If you believe what is right, say it! Why do you have to hide it? I don't care if the one who is asking me is my wife, I will tell her what I believe. If it is my father, I will tell her what I, I, him what I believe. If it is my mother, I will tell her what I believe. It doesn't matter if he or she is my boss, I will tell her what I believe. This is the faith, this is the truth, this is what the Bible says, I am going to say it, whatever the consequence may be. Why? Because one day, I will stand before God. I will, don't you know that I will not answer to you in the end? And don't you know that you will not answer to me at the judgment seat of Christ? All of us will make our accountability before the Lord Jesus Christ. So why do, you have, do I have to deflect my faith because of you? And why do you have to deflect your faith because of me? Don't hide your faith. Tell the word what you believe. And this is the life of the Apostle Paul. He will 
state his faith in public in front of the king. It doesn't matter what the consequences may be. Why? Because as a Christian, we should display our faith. Listen, not to brag about it, not to get the glory, listen, but to glorify God. That is why we're showing our faith. So, the question now is this. If people will look at us, will they say, that's a Christian? Will they say, that person is a citizen of heaven? That person is an alien? Because his actions are not the actions of earthlings. He is from a different world. Because his conduct is different. He, the things that he's doing is different. The things that he is saying is different. I remember one of the uh, entry in Fax's Book of Martyrs is about uh, what happened in 1555 when Queen Mary came to the throne of England. He was uh, the Mary who was known as Bloody Mary. So the drink uh, Bloody Mary was named after her. So when he came to the throne, the first thing that she did is to have 300 Christians executed. You see, like for example, birthday of the president, he will pardon criminals. But Bloody Mary is different. When she was inaugurated to the throne of England, he said, give me 300 Christians and you execute them in my name. So that is what she did. Among the 300 were you, Latimer, and Nicholas Ridley. These are, if you will study church history, these are people who made a difference during the time of uh, the Dark Ages. Actually, Ridley, I believe, is a, a Methodist. And uh, you, Latimer, I believe, is a... He's not a... He, he, I believe he's not a Baptist. That is the reason why we, do not, we should not believe in Baptist brother. Because there are so many people who showed courage defending the faith who are not considered Baptist. Actually, the truth of the matter, if you will go to church history, Baptists already came into, only came into the scene when they were called Anabaptist. But they were not called Baptists all throughout history. And that was just a few hundred years ago. So to say that only Baptists will be the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ is to discount all saved people who uh, showed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that all saved people uh, from the time of the Lord Jesus Christ will be his bride. Not only Baptists. Because if, if you say Baptist bride, how about those who are erring Baptists? So there will be no difference, you see. But to go back to this, you, Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, these are two preachers, they were bound to oppose back to back and they pile wood around them and they set the wood on fire. Latimer uh, got, got the attention of Ridley and he said, be of good comfort, Master Ridley. He said, and play the man we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace and I trust shall never be put out. In the face of death, they showed. They publicly displayed their faith with no fear, even though they're facing death. Why? Because they are doing it for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Can, can we still see such an act in our time? Can we still see such faith displayed in our time? Only because of the anger of a relative, we will remain quiet. Only because our friends will turn their backs on us, we would rather follow what is wrong than stand for what is right. Only because we might lose our job, we are going to cower under the pressure. Why? Because maybe there is really no faith in us. You can only show what you have. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our problem today. 
That is the problem in Christianity. And that is so sad. That is because our church, listen to me, listen gentlemen, listen to me very, very carefully. Our church was given a chance, is given a chance by God to proclaim the truth, to stand for what is right boldly, to show a public display of our faith, and yet, yet, so many of us are cowering under the pressure of standing for what is right. That's why if you're a coward, you have no place in Christianity. If you only think of yourself, you have no place in Christianity. Though we are still Christian because of the grace of God. But ladies and gentlemen, I hope that we are going to respect and honor the grace of God by standing for what is right. Mahirap yung kalagayan natin ngayon. Sabi nga, kakaunti na lang tayo. Hindi pa tayo magkaisa. Hindi pa tayo magpatuloy sa laban. Ipagpapalit pa natin yung binigay sa ating pagkakataon ng Diyos dahil lamang sa mga bagay ng sanlibutan. That is so sad. At kapag ka ang involved, malapit na sa atin, malayo na tayo sa katotohanan. Di ba? Nakakalungkot yun. Sabi ko nga, anong, 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 anong gagawin natin in times like this? I, I always talk to my wife and I said that what I will do may cost us so much. But it doesn't matter if it will be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I may be ostracized from other you know, friends, groups, or whatever, but it doesn't matter because I need to stand for what is right. If I'm not going to do that, then I am not showing a good example and I am not living a life that is becoming of a Christian. Of course, there, there are still areas that I am not, that if you will see, you, you will not say that I'm a Christian. But the default, again, is that we should live worthy of the gospel. And the gospel has requirements. And the requirement of the gospel is for us to live according to the standard of God. So a Christian must be a Christian no matter what. And again, I will close with the life of the Apostle Paul. He says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To the Apostle Paul, life is not important unless life is given or spent for the glory of God. Life will mean nothing if it is not going to be consumed by our zealousness and passion for the glory of God. And listen to me. Life as a part of IBCSR is nothing if we are not going to stand for what is right no matter what the price may be. I hope and I pray that we as a Christian will live as a Christian. And let me end with verse number 29. For unto, unto you, it is given. So there is something given to me, something given to you. Amen? Given to you. Given to me. In the behalf of Christ. Not for us. In the behalf of Christ. Why? We're already saved. We're already citizens of heaven. We're on our way to heaven. No matter what, even if we die today, we'll be in heaven. But it is given unto us in the behalf of Christ. It is a gift. What kind of gift is this? Listen and we will end. What kind of gift is this? Not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer. The gift of suffering. 
Don't you know that suffering is a gift? Why? Because we can be a part of what the Lord Jesus Christ experienced while He was here on earth. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer. Listen, if you are saved and you are given this gift, are you going to suffer or not? You're going to suffer. If you're not going to suffer, it is not given to you. And if it is not given to you, therefore you are not acting in the behalf of Christ because maybe Christ is not in us. But it says not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer. For who? For Jesus. You see, He suffered for us. Now, we can suffer for Him. Amen? Parang, iginapang ka ng magulang mo sa pag-aaral. Nakatapos ka. Kumita ka. Ngayon naman, may pagkakataong kang mabigyan sila ng biyaya. What a privilege. What a gift. What a joy. So I hope and I pray that no matter what happens, we will be willing to suffer for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the glory of God. Shall we stand up, please? Every head's bowed. We have heard our...